Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well today. Welcome to the beginning of the Masterclass series on laser photo engraving. My hope is that through this series you're going to grasp the fundamentals required to take any photograph and turn it into a wonderful work of art on your laser machine. Now I personally have a Glowforge and we'll be referring to it throughout these videos, but fear not, these techniques apply to all laser machines. The only differences will be on the machine specific settings when you actually run the job. So you might be using the Glowforge dashboard, Lightburn, Trotec Ruby, or some other software. It really doesn't matter for the preparation part, only for the final burn. Check with your manufacturer to see if they have suggested settings for your particular machine. If not, make yourself a set of test patches and run that to determine the best settings. I'll talk about that in more details towards the end of the video. I'm going to walk you through step by step all the various techniques and ideas that I've learned over the years so that you have a firm grasp of what's going on and how to accomplish the best possible results. By the end of the first lesson, as long as you stick to the basics, you should be able to get fantastic results on your first attempt. Once you fully understand what's really going on and the reason why we do certain things, you'll be able to take that newfound knowledge and apply it in very creative ways. You're going to be able to experiment and come up with some truly unique looking results. If you stick with it and continue on to the more advanced lessons, you're going to pick up some valuable tips and tricks that will allow you to handle pretty much anything thrown your way. Let's face it, customers can be fairly demanding at times. They'll often ask you to do the near impossible. If you follow along with these lessons closely, I'm certain you're going to become proficient enough to turn around jobs very quickly with stunning results that customers will be thrilled about. As you progress, you may have questions. Please feel free to post them in the comments below and I'll try my very best to answer them all. And so with that, Let's jump right into lesson one. We're going to cover the basic concepts here in this first lesson. And um, so people who are sort of beyond uh, this, just bear with me a little bit here or feel free to zip ahead and uh, pick up uh, when we start getting into the edit itself. Now the photo I'm going to be using here is a stock image and uh, I'll actually make it available uh, in the notes for download so that you can follow along. Um, so feel free to check the notes there and, and grab that photo if you want to follow along. Or you can open up your own photo and uh, use that as well. So those are the options available to you. So I'm going to be using Photoshop today. Um, there are a lot of other alternatives online for the Mac, the PC, um, on both those platforms, as well as some online tools that will operate in the browser. Um, there's also some Linux uh, products as well. Many of these are cross-platform, um, you know, Photoshop, Lightroom, GIMP, Painter, that sort of thing. Uh, on the Mac, you've got some specific ones such as Affinity Photo, Pixelmator, Photor, Acorn. Uh, on the PC, you can use Paint.net, uh, Serif Photo Plus, Corel Paint Shop Pro. Uh, and, and online, there's Pixlr Pro, PicMonkey, Halftone Pro, Canva, just to name a few. But for this particular one, we're going to focus on Photoshop and its capabilities. Um, and a lot of the tools that I'm going to be using are in the other packages as well. So uh, you shouldn't have too much trouble if you're using something else. But I do encourage you to use Photoshop because it is actually going to give you the uh, best possible outcomes. All right. Um, one of the other things I'll be using sort of a combination of uh, keyboard shortcuts as well as going through the menus as well. I've got my machine set up specifically for the way that I work and my workflow. Um, you may have your setup slightly differently, but I'll try to uh, keep you, uh, you know, on track and, and let you know what tools I'm using, that sort of thing. So most of the time, there's also multiple ways to accomplish a simple task or a single task. Um, sometimes, you know, you can do it one way or you can do it another way. Um, and if uh, it's worth pointing out, I will point it out to you. So the important thing here, let's just jump in to the picture. So this is the picture we're going to use today. Um, photo quality is fairly important. Um, starting with the best possible resolution and quality 
gives you the best possible outcome. If you get an image that uh, requires some editing and that sort of thing, maybe it needs some cropping or retouching, uh, background removal, blurring, um, that sort of thing. You know, you should probably discuss that with the client, but you can also use some discretion as well. If it's not going to drastically alter the image um, or it's going to improve the image, it's usually going to be okay by the customer. But again, use your discretion and decide whether or not you want to discuss that ahead of time. Um, what size is the final engrave going to be re in relation to the original? Um, generally speaking, try not to scale images up too much um, because you will see a loss in quality as you enlarge those pixels. Um, Photoshop does a pretty good job of interpolation and, you know, filling in the blanks, if you will. Uh, filling in those pixels that are missing kind of thing as you scale up but it does cause degradation and you should be aware of that the old adage garbage in garbage out um, usually that's true but uh, hopefully there's some stuff I can show you that you know if you stick with these uh, these lessons uh, you'll be able to take some lower quality images and still make them look really good in the final print um, be aware that highly compressed images, um, the more you manipulate them and edit them, the more compression artifacts are going to become visible. You'll see blocking and visible color noise and that sort of thing. So tonality is important as well. So if you look at this image, we're viewing it in color, but remember, we're not going to be printing it in color. We're going to be printing it in black and white. Um, and part of the uh, image is actually going to be the grain of the wood, the color of the wood, that sort of thing. So we want to have an image that's got good dynamic range, lots of shadow details, and hopefully not too many blown out highlights. Um, but when we look at this particular image, it's very saturated, um, has really good colors and tonality. But if I just quickly jump into black and white here, you're going to see that there isn't a lot of tonal range currently. Um, you know, her sweater is obviously a lot lighter and her face and skin tone is a little bit lighter. But generally speaking, the tone across the image is fairly similar. So what we need to do is introduce a lot of contrast, um, bring out a lot of the details so that it ends up being a very good image engrave. Uh, we're going to do some dodging and burning and we're going to do some level adjustments, some sharpening, all kinds of things that we're going to do here to improve this. So I encourage you to make your adjustments. Um, if you're going to need to scale the image up um, or down even for that matter but generally when you're going to scale it up I would encourage you to make all of your adjustments prior to doing the scaling um, because when you scale you are either going to be adding information to the image um, through interpolation or you're going to be throwing information away um, in terms of scaling it down and it's always better if we do all of our adjustments ahead of time before doing the scaling. We're going to do all our adjustments here uh, in RGB mode as we convert it to a grayscale image. Um, don't just do what a lot of people do and go image mode grayscale because you're going to get a lot different outcome than if we do it by selecting adjustment black and white where we can now go in and manipulate the different tones and colors um, to give us a better outcome okay so we'll start at the top we'll start with the reds now it's a fall scene so if we turn off the preview here it's a fall scene so there's a lot of reds in this especially in the leaves um, she's got a lot of red tone in her in her skin um, even in her sweater it's picking up the uh, surrounding colors and basically reflecting off of her sweater um, so we've got some red tones in there as well she's wearing black pants um, and black of course is uh, terrible to deal with but we will deal with it just the same 
and of course the foliage in the background we've got a mix of a lot of green and then in the tree trunks we've got some some red tones and stuff as well so you're going to see all of that sort of change here as i push this slider up and you can see how everything gets lighter that's in the red areas so what we want to do is we want to make her stand out from the background now because the background is quite dark and she's quite light that's going to help us because we've already got a bit of that separation but we want to accentuate that a little bit more but at the same time remember that darker areas will burn in a lot darker on the laser and uh, it's going to cause warping and uh, a lot of a lot of charring and that sort of thing so we want to minimize that as well but when we get into this here so we're going to end up pushing up the reds and you're going to immediately see that things lighten we're going to go into the yellows and we're going to push those up as well okay now it's really important when doing photo engraves you shouldn't be looking at the image from the standpoint of oh it looks really good to my eye should look really good on the photo engrave well that's not the case at all um, when the laser is engraving um, we have to take into account something that's referred to as dot gain so as the wood is being burned um, the dots that are actually being placed down on the wood spread and when they spread it optically makes it darker so you've got a lot of uh, close together dots as they spread the the gaps between the dots are actually going to fill in and you're going to end up with black so we have to take that into account so we need to deal with dot gain as well so i'm just going to go through this making some adjustments and get what i perceive to be uh, a fairly good starting point okay so just follow along with me here So the background, I want it to be fairly flat, fairly even, because after all, the background isn't really what's important. The picture of the girl is what's most important here. And we want some good separation. Now, because we're printing on wood, skin tones, quite important. We need the skin to be as light as possible. Um, you know, speaking the fact that she's Caucasian here, uh, we want the skin to be light as possible so that the color of the wood is the flesh tone. But if we go too light, the uh, highlights will, will blow out and we'll end up with these really distracting sort of uh, transitions from, from the wood to darker areas. And you'll see that in the dot pattern later on. So that's pretty good. Let's see if we push the magenta, what happens here. So I'm just noticing in, in, in her knees, um, not anywhere else really. Okay. So that's what we're left with. All right. And just looking here, um, uh, we're going to want to lighten up her pants because obviously that's going to get really dark. So I'm just going to turn on my tools so you can see what's going on. And we're going to go with the dodge and burn tool. Okay, it's this one right here. I've got it set for a shortcut of O. Um, with Photoshop, if you hold the shift key down and you type the letter, it cycles through each of the tools. Okay. So for right now, I'm going to dodge. Now dodge means that we're going to uh, lighten an image. Okay, burning is darkening an image. I've got my midtones set here right now. Uh, so we've got shadows, highlights, midtones. Um, set my exposure to a lower number. Let's set that to like four. Okay, and we're just going to go in here and we're going to start to paint on her pants to lighten it up and bring out the midtones. Okay, we can switch this to shadows. 
Okay, use the square bracket tool to either uh, make the brush bigger or smaller. The important thing with doing dodging and burning is do it in small increments. That's why I have my number set so low here to 4%. Um, I don't want to have big drastic changes. So, for example, if I push this up to 50% and I start doing it in here, you're going to see that there's going to be a really abrupt change. Um, you know, use your discretion. I say do it a little bit at a time. Just so you have more fine control. Because as we talked about earlier, what's really important is that we get contrast between areas. So if we go into the uh, history panel here, you know, we just zip up to the top, you can see the change. Okay. Now some of you may be using a Wacom tablet with a pen, uh, others may be using a mouse. Um, I prefer to use a mouse actually. Uh, use whatever tools work best for you. Okay, now we're going to go in and we're going to lighten her complexion. Again, we want to bring out the skin tones and the highlights without completely blowing them out. So if we go into the levels, which is command uh, or I believe control L, um, and you hold down the option or uh, things alt key and click on the highlights you can see where it's blowing out as I drag this up okay so if I just start sliding that over you can see that the highlights in the face are just starting to turn white okay and we've got some blown out highlights in the leaves and that sort of stuff that's okay that's totally fine. Make the brush a little smaller. Let's paint in here. Try to follow the contours, the natural contours. You know, if her cheeks are uh, are lighter than her jowl, then you know, continue to lighten the cheeks a little bit more than the jowl. You know, the chin might have a little bit more of a highlight on it that sort of thing. Uh, typically a lot of times you're going to see some shadowing on the forehead. I like to bring back the eyebrows so there's two things you can do. You can either go in here and you can select the burn tool or you can hold the option or alt key down and that's going to convert temporarily the uh, dodge tool to the burn tool. So if I hold it down and then start painting, it's darkening rather than light lightening. Okay, I'm going to go in and lighten the eyes. Now I can't emphasize this enough. The eyes are probably the most important thing you can do to make a photo engrave successful or fail. A lot of times I'll go in and I will add highlights back into the eyes um, to give them life. Especially when the picture is farther away 
or if it's really blurry or grainy, I'm going to go in and I'm going to add the, uh, the catch light in the eyes just so that they pop. It makes the person come to life. So I'm just brightening the catch lights. Okay, and then I'm going to go in and do a little darkening on the rim of the eye. Just a little bit into the folds. You don't want to do, like especially on, on ladies, you don't want to accentuate, you know, the smile lines and the wrinkles in the eyes and things like that. You want to, you want to diminish those. So it's okay to lighten those up. Right? For men, sure, you can, you can accentuate the, the wrinkles and the, and the lines and that sort of stuff because, you know, it makes a guy look more rugged. But we don't want the ladies to look rugged. Right? We want to bring out their natural beauty. I don't, you know, I don't encourage you to totally get rid of them, but certainly you can diminish them. Use your discretion. So a lot of dodging and burning. It's going to get rid of a little bit more of the shadow under the nose and on the lip. Okay. Well, sometimes I like to go in and I like to accentuate the smile line and the dimple. Just helps the face stand out a little bit more. And her lips sort of disappearing here, um, just because of the tone of her lipstick, or if she's even wearing lipstick. So I'm going to go in, I'm going to darken her lip a little bit. Careful of the teeth and the gum line. When you do this too, use a nice soft brush. Don't use a hard brush. That way you'll get nice transitions. Okay, and then go in and lighten the teeth. We don't want to look like she's uh, into chewing tobacco. Okay, let's darken that bottom lip a little bit. Again, I'm holding the option key down on my Mac here just to switch it to burn and darken things up. There we go. And we're going to go in and we're going to lighten up some of the shadow detail in the hair. going to bring this up to uh, let's go to 15 you can really see the contrast come out in the hair tree up back here because I don't want that really standing out too much. Again, we want to diminish 
stuff that's not important. Now we've got this little... I don't know what that is. Some debris flying around, probably. So I'm just going to take my clone stamp tool, or you can use the uh, the uh, spot healing brush tool. Sorry, switched over to the healing brush. Clone stamp tool. Just paint that in. So we're picking up from here, and we're laying it down here. All right, show you that one more time. So I'm going to sample by holding the option key from this area. And I'm just cloning this over top of this. Okay. That's pretty good. All right. Now we're going to go in and sharpen this up. Okay. So that's looking pretty good. Okay. As we sharpen it, we'll also see some things uh, appear that we might want to do some adjustments on. So we're going to do some sharpening. And when we sharpen, we don't use the sharpen tool. So we've got sharpen right here. We don't want to use that. We actually want to use this one here called unsharp mask. Unsharp mask is uh, it's terminology from photography. Um, and it used to be done in the darkroom. Uh, and I won't get into all the details of how they did it. But basically what we're doing is we're adding contrast between uh, or we're accentuating contrast between two areas of contrast. So if white butts up against black, we're going to add sort of an intermediate gray line, and that's going to make it appear sharper. Um, so if I just turn all this down, and there's nothing applied right now, so if I flip this on off, you see nothing happens. So I've got the amount of unsharp masking that I'm going to apply, the radius, so how far um, of spread that the uh, filter is going to affect. So think of it if you've got one pixel and then we start to expand the radius, it affects the pixels on either side of it all the way around 360 degrees. It's going to affect those the wider the radius goes. Um, and the threshold that's basically like a clip so we can cut off which levels um, there's 256 levels of gray and if we push the threshold up to say 30 everything below 30 levels of gray, so from 0 to 30 won't be affected everything above it will be affected okay hopefully that makes sense so we're going to first start with the amount. And we're going to use a high amount. So we're going to push that up to, let's start with 80. And then we're going to say start affecting all the pixels and go out to a radius of 5.5. That's pretty good to start. And then we can push the threshold up so that if you can see here, the noise is starting to appear. If we start to push the threshold up, it affects the noise less. We can increase the intensity, we can increase the radius. So you can see that it appears sharper. Now you can really see it's obvious here what's going on. You see area of contrast between black and almost white, right? Well, gray. So it's putting in this lighter area in here to make it appear sharper. If I push this down, just take note of what's happening there. So I push it up. Let's go really, ex well, that's maybe a little extreme. So I push it up and you can see how it gets wider. Those areas get wider. So that's what Unsharp Mask does. And it's super effective when doing photo engraving. It's really important. Really important to use it. Okay. So we're going to start with that. Maybe we'll push the threshold up just a little bit more. Let's just see what's going on. That's pretty good. So we're going to do that. I'm just going to zoom out. Now I'm going to apply it one more time. And you can see that everything got a little bit sharper again. Right? So there's without and there's with. Okay. 
That's looking pretty good. All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to adjust the levels. So we're going to go to image, adjustment, levels. First, let's check where we're turning to white. And I want to start pushing this up until just where her skin starts to blow out the highlights. So you see, if I did that, her face would be completely white. We don't want that. So I just want that right about there. Okay. And black, if we check the black, we can also see as we pull this down, that's where things start to turn black. But we want to get rid of all the black. We don't want anything to be completely black. So we're going to go down here to output levels to the black slider. And we're going to start to push this up to between 90 and 100. Okay, and it's going to make everything lighter. Let's go to 100. There we go. Now take a look at the histogram here right now. It goes all the way across. If I hit OK, now I go back to it. All of this got clipped off. Okay, you can see that. So now we're left with this. Okay. We're going to do one more thing here. And we're going to go into image, adjustments, brightness, and contrast. And we're going to bump the contrast up to 10. Now it's pretty subtle. So if I toggle back and forth, you might be able to see that. But we're just bumping the dark tones up a little bit and lightening the light tones just a little bit without affecting the white areas. Okay? So if we go and we look at her face and we just pull up the levels one more time and hold hold down on the option key on the white slider, we can see that we haven't cause it to get any whiter. Okay? Okay? But that's looking pretty good. Alright. Now that I've done that, I'm going to go and I'm going to do sharpening one more time, but I don't want to use the same settings that I used last time. Okay? I want to be more fine with my sharpening adjustment here. So I'm going to push this down a little bit. And I'm going to push this up a little bit. Okay. That's going to allow for a lot more fine adjustment. And I'm going to bring this down just a smidge too. So if you pay attention to the hair and in the, the knit sweater... If I turn this on and off, you can see how it's bringing out those accents. Okay? Alright. Now, I realize it starts to look a little weird, and that's okay. So now, what size are we going to make this? Well, for this particular one, I think I'm going to go 8 by 10 and I'm going to crop it vertically. So, we're going to go 8 by 10 and we're going to set it to 425 pixels per inch. So 8 by 10 by 425 pixels per inch. And I'm just going to position this where I think it looks best. Nicest composition. Okay. And hit enter. There we go. Okay. And now we're going to do the secret sauce. Okay, so we're going to go up here to image. Now remember, this whole time, we haven't been working in grade scale. We've been working in RGB. You can see we're still in RGB. So now we're going to convert it to grayscale. We don't need to show that. And we're going to say yes, discard all of the color information, because we don't have any. It's all grayscale now. Discard it. Then we're going to go to image mode bitmap. And we want to set the output to 425 pixels per inch. That matches what we've got up here. Now you can actually, if let's say the, the image was 300 pixels per inch or 
you know, 800 pixels per inch, whatever, it doesn't really matter. When we come in here to the final output, we want to set this to 425. Make sure this is set to halftone screen. This is super important. Not any of these other ones. It must be halftone screen. Say OK. We're going to set the frequency to, we'll set it to 80. Minus 35 degrees and set the shape to line. Now this is going to convert this to a half tone. On the Glowforge, for example, you have the setting in the dashboard that says convert to dots or convert to pattern. That's similar to this, but don't ever use that. Don't ever use those settings because they do a terrible job. We can do a much better job in Photoshop or in one of the other tools. Okay, so we're going to say okay. Now what just happened? You can see that the image has been converted to a half tone. And this looks really odd when you zoom in, right? If you've never seen a half tone before, I mean, if you've looked at a newspaper, with the magnifying glass, you can see the halftone pattern in a newspaper photo. Um, same idea here, except that we're using a line pattern instead of a dot pattern. Okay. And we choose the 35 degrees. That's based on some testing that I've done, and it gives the best results. Um, based on how the laser head is moving. Um, so whether you're printing this in this orientation or you rotate it in any one of the other directions, you're going to get the same result regardless of what you do. Um, if you choose any other angle, it has an effect on the shadow and highlight and midtone transitions in a way that isn't obvious um, when you think about it but when you apply it in practice it makes a big difference so just trust me on this one use minus 35 degrees and you will have good results every time okay so you can see where the dots are going to appear so if we zoom out like that's what the image is going to look like, but darker. Okay, so there we go. That's the image. Now we're going to save this. Now it's eight by 10. So we're going to save as PNG. And we're going to save this in, well, I'll put in my being printed. We're going to call this we're going to call this 8x10 girl example. And we're going to save it. Large file size. OK. Now the reason I called it 8x10 was so that when I go to the dashboard, I know what size to put in in the dashboard, especially if I'm doing a bunch of these in a day. Okay, so one last thing I want to do here uh, before I forget. Uh, I actually want this to be an oval with an oval cut line. So first we're going to go in and we're going to switch the mode back, back to grayscale. Ratio, leave that at 1. Okay, so it's still got the halftone pattern applied to it, but it's a grayscale image now. That's We have to do that because uh, the way Photoshop handles um, certain image modes, we need to switch it to grayscale so that we can apply some layer uh, type adjustments and uh, do some masking and that sort of thing. So we're going to go here and select the ellipse tool uh, and then we're going to draw an ellipse now this is a shape. You can see the handles there. We're going to drag that to the edges. Snapping's turned on, so uh, it snaps to the edge. If yours isn't snapping, go up to View and make sure Snap is turned on. 
Okay, so we've got that, and we're going to set this to no fill. All right, um, so now I've got this all set, and I'm just going to hit enter, lock that in. Now I'm going to hold the command or alt, I think, on PC, um, and click on the icon for the ellipse and that turns it into a selection okay and then I'm going to invert the selection so if I go up here I'm going to say inverse now everything outside of that area is selected and I want to make sure my foreground is set to white so I'm just going to go and select the background layer and we're going to go to fill and I want to use the foreground color, which is white. Fill that with white. Okay. Now I'm going to go back here to the ellipse. And I want to go to path. And I want to save the path as cut line. Okay. And I want to... export paths to illustrator and I'm going to choose cut line and we're going to save it here we're going to call it cut line and get rid of this now select both of those and get rid of them And I'm going to save the file one more time. Just save over top of the one that I previously saved. There we go. Because I don't want the laser... I could have just left this rectangular. But I don't want the laser having to take all the time to engrave all of this other area. Because that's going to increase the amount of time that it takes um, substantially. Probably adds you know, a half an hour or longer to the engraving time if it's got to fill in all of this other area. So important to trim all that off and just have it as white. Okay. So now we're going to jump over to Illustrator. So now we're going to jump over here and we're going to create a new document. Well, actually, we don't have to create a new document. So we're going to over here and we're going to open. We're going to open that path that we created. Okay, so you can't see anything right now, but the object is there, okay, and it doesn't have any fill or stroke. What we want to do is apply a stroke. Uh, let's go make it black, okay, you can really make it any color you want, as long as it has a stroke, that way the dashboard's going to see it. And then we're just going to go in and we're going to save this as a PDF or an SVG, you can do either one. Actually, let's do SVG for this particular one. We'll call it uh, Girl Cut Line SVG. We don't need converted in there. Uh, more options. Turn off responsive. Always make sure responsive is turned off. That way, when you bring it into the dashboard, it's going to be the exact size that you created it. If responsive is turned on, then it will scale. Okay, and we don't want that to happen. So we want it to remain at 8 by 10. Just say okay. And then we're going to jump over to the dashboard here. Okay, and we're going to first bring in the cut line. 
And if we go in here and look, it is indeed 8 by 10. We'll position that at 0 0.01 from the top on the Y. And at roughly 0.85 on the X using the corner widget. Okay, uh, we're just going to set this. This really doesn't matter what we set this to. Um, I'm using quarter inch uh, maple from Home Depot, um, Columbia Force products. And so it really doesn't matter what we put in here. We could put maple, we could put hardwood. Let's just, you know, pick aspen, whatever. It doesn't matter. We're going to set the cut. We'll go to manual. We're going to set this to 260. Full power. We're going to set it to two passes. And always make sure, whoops, this is set to auto. Okay. Now I've got this other layer in here. These are my guidelines down here. Just ignore those. Um, I only use those occasionally if I have to do precision placement. Now we're going to bring in the photo. And you can see the size changed. That's because of a bug in dashboard. Um, it doesn't really honor dimensions of anything other than an SVG that's non-responsive um, because it always views white as transparent and then it sort of clips everything off. So we'll make sure this is locked and we're set this to eight. And you can see that it sort of gets a little bit wonky. I don't know why it does this. It drives me crazy. So you can see it's not even exact. Anyway, let's set this to uh, 0.8. Set this, whoop. Remember, it was from the corner. Set this to 0.8. And set this to 0 0.01. And because we are slightly different size, whoops, was it 0.85? Sorry, it was 0 0.85. 0 0.85, there. Okay, now because of the kerf on the laser, that minuscule amount of 0 0.004 inches isn't going to matter. It will cut it right to the edge. So, Here's the most important part in here. So we're going to go to engrave. Okay. And make sure engrave is first. Cut is always second. Um, go into engrave. And we're going to set the settings. Um, if you're on basic or plus, leave this at 1,000. Set the power to 90. Turn off convert to dots because we've already done that. We've converted it to dots. So set it to very power. Turn down this margin optimization a little bit. About there. That's going to just give you a little bit of extra breathing room on the sides and it's not going to affect the quality. Set the lines per inch to 270. Number of passes 1. And again, this should be auto. Okay. Now we're going to do a set focus. And this is a lot of people go wrong here. They'll set the uh, thickness height, material height, to either whatever proof grade says or whatever it defaults to. And then what happens is the um, focus height is slightly off from the actual material height and it causes the image to get blurry and it really degrades the, the uh, photo engrave. So we're setting everything to auto and we're going to rely on the laser uh, that's inside the Glowforge printhead to set the focus height. And we're going to do the face because that's obviously the most important thing. So we're going to focus on the face. We're going to let the Glowforge do its thing. 
Okay, I just wanted to pause here for a second and uh, bring up something that I forgot to mention earlier. Uh, the importance of using pins on your material to hold it down to the crumb tray. Uh, that is super important to make sure that we maintain as flat a material as possible. Try to use material that has no warping um, or one that you can control the warp by using the pins uh, because any amount of lift or variation is going to cause the laser to go slightly out of focus and that will greatly affect the results of your engrave. So just make sure you're using pins. Okay, and I realize my camera is quite dirty right now, so it's kind of hard to see here. But there we go. We want to make sure that this is pink. That means it will print, it will engrave. Um, if I select this, you can see that the margin here has got some breathing room. We could even push this over a bit if we want. Okay, get a little bit closer. That way, you know, you might have a little bit of extra material left over. That's what that margin optimization did, is it pushed this back this direction. It allows us more room. It slows the print head down a little bit sooner um, to put the brakes on before it reverses direction, goes back the other way, basically. All right, there we go. We're all ready to go, and we're going to hit print. And this is going to take a bit of time. And what most people don't understand is when this is getting pushed up to the server um, to be processed, it has to plot the mathematical calculations for every single laser dot in this image. So it takes some time to do all those calculations before it spits it back to your Glowforge machine and is ready for printing. So this can take anywhere, depending on the size of the image, if this image took up this whole entire piece of uh, material, piece of wood, uh, it could take 10, 15 minutes or longer, depending on your internet connection speed, to process the image um, at 425 pixels per inch. Okay, so it's gonna take a bit of time. So be patient. Uh, it will eventually finish, and you'll be good to go. So we're just going to wait for this to finish. There we go. This uh, is going to take 1 hour and 12 minutes at these settings. Now, before I go ahead and do that, I just want to show you the settings that I use on my machine, typically. And that is, because I'm running a Pro, um, I can push this up to 1200 at 98 for power okay and let's just cancel this and then we're gonna rerun it and we're gonna see how much time it's gonna take now okay remember we talked about margin optimization notice that the margin got wider and the margin got wider because we've increased the speed of the printhead. Okay, so it's gonna be moving quicker. It needs more time to slow down before it turns around and goes the other way. All right, so we go back to 0.85 and now it's good. Okay, that's why I chose 0.85 to begin with because that's usually what I use for my settings. All right, so you can see that it's now going to print. So let's just prepare that one more time. All right, so there we go. Now the new time is one hour and five minutes. So we've basically taken about 10 minutes off the print time by bumping that speed up to 1200 as opposed to 1000. Okay, so let's print this and take a look at the results.
All right, let's take a look at one more example here. Now, this one here is actually uh, sepia toned already, um, so we're not going to have to do too many adjustments on the color side of things. Uh, but just the same, let's go in here and have a quick look if we switch this to black and white. So we push the red up, we can lighten the image quite a bit. Let's keep pushing it and see where we get. It's actually looking pretty darn good. This is a fairly straightforward, but if we look, his face is almost matching the tone of the background here. So let's just lighten his face a bit more compared to the background. And we may just darken the background a smidge as well. We're just going to go in here. Switch this to midtones. Do a quick check here, make sure we're not blowing out the highlights. And you can see there's fairly even uh, distribution across the skin. So we'll just lighten it just a bit more. That's pretty good. I'm just going to go in here and darken this a little bit as it gets near to the face. Actually, it'll look a bit like a shadow hitting the back here as well, which just helps to emphasize it even more. That's pretty good. Let's just darken his shirt just a smidge. Now I'm just darkening the midtones. That's going to add some variation. And let's lighten this back here. pretty good. Let's go and have a look at his teeth. So you can see there's quite a bit of grain in this and we'll deal with that in just a second. Grain is actually not a bad thing provided you deal with it in the proper way. Now, we were talking earlier about the fact that the eyes are really important, and you can see that he's squinting here. We can't even see his eyes, except for just a hint of a catch light right here. Nothing going on over here. 
So there's not a lot we can do with that in terms of bringing out his eyes. But I do want to focus in on this catch light right here. So we're going to switch over to the brush tool. So that's B on your keyboard. And we're going to pick a smaller brush. But we want to make sure it's soft. And we're going to set the, uh, the opacity to around 5. And make sure that we're at white. And we're just going to click in here a few times. There we go. And then just paint a little bit there just so it's not perfectly round. And one might imagine that you could see a little bit of the white of the eye over here. That's going around the, the iris and the pupil. So we're just going to put in a little bit of that. So now all of a sudden he has an eye. Where before it was just a squinty black hole. And over here, he's pretty much got his eye closed. But we can just put a smidge of white. Just going to make that a little bit smaller and turn up the flow a little bit. Let's go to 20. See what happens there. So now all of a sudden he's got an eye in here as well. And there's a little bit of a catch light right there. I don't know if you can see that. We're just going to accentuate that a little bit. Now it doesn't seem like much on such a large picture, but even when you zoom back, when you pull out, you can see those catch lights. And those will show up in the final engrave. So before we had a guy who was squinting and just had blackness there. Now he's got some life in his eyes. He's got some sparkle. A little bit of sparkle in his eyes there. Okay, so now we're going to back up. Let's, uh, let's decide what size this one's going to be. Uh, we'll make it 10 by 12. So we're going to put in 10 by 12 inches at 425. Oh, except we need to be wide. Now you don't necessarily have to center it. In fact, centered photos aren't always the best. You notice the grid here. This is breaks this into the quadrants the nine quadrants. You usually want the eyes to sit on one of these quadrant lines. Usually gets you the best crop. Let's just crop it and see what happens. So it did go a little bit bigger. Okay, I'm just going to go back for a second, because remember I said do all your adjustments before you scale. So we're going to go in and we're going to sharpen this up. So again, we're going to go to Unsharp Mask, and we're going to set this to a fairly wide radius. And you can immediately see what's happening. And you can see his eyes are even coming more to life, even, even still. That's looking pretty good. Okay, and let's go into our levels. So 
because it was such a grainy photo, you can see we can push this way up and you can see it's not blowing out the highlights. It's actually just diminishing the grain in his skin. And that's okay. We're going more to white teeth down here. All right, you can see that. So this is all a good thing. So sometimes even adding noise to your image can give you a much better result than you would normally get. What's happening in his shirt there. So his shirt's going out a little bit uh, to the highlight side. It's blowing out a bit. That's okay. Let's just push that up. Check that. Make sure nothing weird's going on. What's happening with his neck? That's looking pretty good. Remember we talked about the wrinkles. This is one of those cases where the wrinkles actually give this guy character, right? That's really part of his part of his persona. Uh, really stands out. I'm just gonna bring that down just a smidge. And actually, let's just back out of here for a second. Let's go into our curves. So we can start to push the whole thing up tonally. And if we put a little bit of an S curve, we can also increase the contrast. And if we just check our info we can see wherever I put the mouse dropper or the, the mouse dropper, the eye dropper, mm -hmm. um, we can look over here and we can see what our levels are. Okay. Remember we're working in RGB and 256 levels of gray. So right now, pure white being 256, we're at about 247. So we're getting close to white, but we're not quite at white. Okay, so I can bring back more of the black, increasing that contrast. That's pretty good. So let's go back to levels now. Let's check that. Let's bring that up. That's pretty good. I'm pretty happy with that. Okay, now we're going to clip the shadow. So we're going to clip the black and we're going to push that up. Um, let's go to 95 for this one. There we go. Okay. And again, we're going to increase that contrast by 10. Now, I'm pretty happy with everything. The sharpening, everything's looking pretty good. So we're going to go and crop this. Remember we put in that 12 by 10 inches. Let's just position that. There we go. That's looking pretty good. And let's just hit it with one more unsharp mask. Let's drop this back down. Drop the radius back down. Now if we drop it too low, we're going to actually start sharpening the noise and we don't want to do that. There we go. One final check. Looks good. No blown out highlights. go to mode, switch that to grayscale, and then we're going to go to bitmap. Remember 425, halftone screen, okay, 80 lines per inch, minus 35 degrees, shape is line, 
Okay, let's just go in and see what's happening. I like that. So we got a little bit of dot. Just so we don't have any blank white areas. The only thing I would say is right here, it transitions a little too much. So what we're going to do, just to bring that back a little bit before we commit. So I undid that. And I'm just going to go in here and I'm just going to darken this up just, just a smidge. And I'm just going to paint right along where his face is. remember it's going to look like a shadow on the back anyway. So just alternating using the option or the alt um, just alternating between dodging and burning just to make it look natural and if I go down to a really small brush I can make that line just a little bit harder Pretty good. Okay, one more time back to bitmap. Now it's going to remember all my settings from last time, so just hit OK, OK. And now we've got some separation between his face and the background. Everything else is looking pretty good. There's those nice catch lights in the eyes. Really brings him to life. Now it's important that you put those catch lights in the right spot. So they don't look cross-eyed, or they don't look kind of bizarre, you know. So if you need to, take a look in the mirror at your own eyes or whatever and really get an idea of where the pupil sits and where catch lights hit and that sort of thing. Take a look at where the shadows are in the photo um, so that you can figure out where the lights are coming from, that sort of thing, where the reflections might be. And uh, just play around putting those catch lights in and, and finding what works best for you. All right. So there we go. I think we're ready to go and print this one up. And uh, let's see what the results are going to be. So let's go to save as. Being printed. And we're going to call this smiley guy. Uh, 12 whoops, by 10 PNG, save. Now because this one's a rectangle, I just have my rectangle set up on my uh, photo engraving uh, project in the dashboard. I've got a little bit of a rounded corner set on it and um, I just use that one all the time. So there we go, it's ready to go. So let's quickly jump over to the dashboard and set this job up to print. And while we're doing that, uh, I just wanted to talk about the uh, settings needed for other lasers. If you plan to engrave your photos on a machine other than a Glowforge, then it's important that you run some test patches to find the optimal settings. Crop in on a small detailed area of the image and save it out to a separate file. Then bring that file into your laser control software and set up a few patches on one print job with several different settings for each one. Make small adjustments to each and take notes along the way. 
Remember, don't scale the patches inside your laser's control software, or this will alter the pixel density of the image and cause you problems. And again, doesn't matter what we set this to. We're going to set this, because I'm on the Pro, we're going to set this to 1200. Ninety-eight. Um, you would uh, on any other machine or on the Pro. It doesn't matter. You set this to one thousand ninety for precision power. Set to very power. Push the margin up op and optimization down a bit. Lines per inch always two seventy. Always one pass. Always auto. So these are your optimal settings for the Pro and again just change this to a thousand and this to 90 if you're on any other machine alright now you can see it's all pink for for good uh, we got just a little bit of a breathing room there it's all good so I'm gonna go load up the machine with some uh, with some material and close the lid and we'll get this print underway. I'm so glad you were able to join me today. I hope you were able to get some valuable information and set yourself on the way to success. If you liked this video, please click the like button as it'll help elevate the channel and search results and suggested viewing. Please don't forget to post your questions and comments. And if you haven't already subscribed, I encourage you to do so. That one simple click of the mouse or trackpad will let me know if people are interested in this type of content and it will give me the encouragement to do more of them. Don't forget to click the notification bell and then click all so that you're notified the moment I post new videos. If you haven't yet purchased your own laser unit, whether it's a Glowforge or some other machine, and you want to save some significant money on your purchase, I put my referral codes in the show notes below. If you use my codes, you're going to save up to $500 on the new purchase of a Glowforge. And full disclosure, I will get an equal amount of store credit to purchase materials so that I can continue to produce great content. Thanks very much for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.